<laughs> so clearly these are very troubled times and um, it just shows how very quickly a storm can arise and blow away everything we thought we knew. This kind of destruction has happened many, many times in history. Um, there is no safety in samsara. For us, that's the basic point of view. Wherever you look, uh, all over the world, whether it's um, Eskimo communities or people in the jungles or people in Australia now with flooding, all kind of sudden disturbances occur and the security and the prediction tomorrow will be like today is just blown away. And what is happening in Ukraine is a very extreme and vicious form of this, but the structure is basically the same. So the, the text in this little practice uh, are taken primarily from uh, the, the recent book on Amitabha, on the Pure Land. Uh, and it begins with the usual refuge and bodhicitta. So we say, I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and the assembly of the excellent ones until enlightenment is gained. Now, this, of course, is very important because if you have a refuge like that, then you're holding on to something which is simple and grounded and true and helpful. This is an enormous protection against doing harm yourself or other people harming you. Because it's saying, uh, my orientation is on awakening and liberation. So when, you, when we say these words, we have to think of the implications of them. For example, you can take refuge in the motherland or the fatherland. You can say, I am Scottish, or I am Polish, or I am Ukrainian, or I am Russian. And when you take refuge in a narrow identification like that, you're immediately in a world of oppositions. Because due to history and geography and politics and economic resources, there are many, many structural oppositions embedded in how people are in their identification with countries. And this is very difficult. So when we hear, uh, you know, people being prepared to take up guns and to act in a way that will be to protect people, on the one hand, our heart can feel for them because who would not want to protect what is dear to them? But we also can see that these objects of investment in value are unstable in themselves. So this is a very real and deep thing for us, that we have compassion for people because they try to take refuge in something which can give them very little refuge. National identity, gender identity, economic status identity, all the relative truth foundations of identity are very, very fragile. They arise due to circumstances. They are held in place by patterns of circumstances and they can easily be undermined. So it's very important to, to really reflect for ourselves on a relative level, I can do my best to help other people and, and so on. So we can we can have offer support and fellow feeling with those who suffer when the foundations of their world are under attack, and that is a terrible thing. But we also can try to offer people the sense that liberation from dualistic attachment is a better security 
So then we say, through the virtue of practicing generosity and the other perfections, may I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. And this means the people who we think of as selfish and bad and dangerous, as well as the people who we might see as victims and at the mercy of uh, difficult forces. In our Dharma of the Middle Way, we try to avoid all extremes and polarities. We're not believing in some eternal relative value. We're not believing in the absolute oblivion and death. We want to find a way that says to help, in order to help all beings with an open heart, I cannot have any bias. If I identify myself as Scottish, then I don't want to help the English. If I think I'm from Glasgow, I don't want to help the people from Edinburgh. We all know these nationalistic turns. The people in the valley don't like the hill people and so on. There are so many ways in which narrow identification creates opposition. So when we say, may all beings be happy, we're doing something enormous to ourselves. In the Mahayana, they say the development of real compassion is a slow process, because you imagine how small and bigoted you can be. You might get see some child has been blown up in the war, and then you think, oh, these fucking Russians, why do they do this? They are terrible. It's very easy to have that kind of feeling. And you, oh. Now I'm saying this is good, that is bad, and you pulled over into these extremes, and it happens very easily. So we come back to the middle way, may all beings be happy, which opens our heart to be inclusive. I'm not saying people are to be helped on the basis of their qualities, the things I like or admire about them, but just for the fact that they have life. And the basis of the life is the mind. They are people with a mind. And the root of the mind is not different from the Dharmakaya of all the Buddhas. It is because we don't realize the nature of our mind that we get lost into prejudice and bias and confusion. So developing bodhicitta is to be aware that the infinite potential of the Buddha is present in me, so I have to stay open, and it's also present in all beings. So if I put them in a box through my prejudicial definition, everything will be constricted, and I will be pulled necessarily into liking some and not liking others. This is a big work to avoid doing that. So then the next, this familiar seven branch practice, which we use in order to accumulate merit so we can dedicate the merit for the benefit of other beings. We make prostrations or salutations. We make offerings to all the Buddhas. We have elaborated forms of these practice, which you can read, but in a short form, you imagine in front of you, the whole sky is full of Buddhas. Each Buddha is surrounded by a great ocean of bodhisattvas, all of them radiant with light, and they're all gazing at you. You are in connection with the Buddha. Because in the Mahayana, we are, it's, a, it's, it's a transactional mode, a conversational mode. The problem for the ego self is it goes into isolation. There's just me getting on with my life, what I like, what I don't like. We are like some mole living under the ground, living in a little tunnel. But when we do this practice and we see, oh, 24 hours a day, in every situation, the Buddhas are looking at me with love in their heart, with light in their eyes, and this is what I can connect to. So I make offerings to them. I say, please give us more light. All these problems in the world, all the problems of war, selfishness, cruelty, arise from the hardening of the heart. Then we confess, because when we confess our limitations, 
we are distancing ourselves from our limitation. What we like, what we don't like, who we take to be insiders and who we push out to be outsiders. Whenever we find this kind of structure, which leads into theft, exploitation, cruelty in relationships, unkindness to children, every possible form of harm arises from duality, from thinking I am real, you are real, I'm better than you, I need what you've got. All the nastiness arises from that, which is a delusion. So confession is primarily deeply to see I believe in entities. I believe in the inherent existence of phenomena. In so many sutras and tantras the Buddhas have taught, this is a false view. There are no self-existing people. If we stop breathing, we die. If we stop eating and drinking, also our body will go into decline and die. We are relational in the world. We talk with other people, we go to school, we work with other people. Our life is fulfilled through relational contact. So it's, uh, it's vital to be able to, to feel open to respond to other people. So confession is to free yourself from the guilty self-critique, which makes you shrink inside, so you feel unworthy or bad or harmful, and then relax out of that so that you become available. We rejoice in the merit of others. This is the great, great protection against envy. This war which is raging at the moment has many systems of fuel going into it, but one is certainly envy. How can it be that this country which wants democracy has quite a good economy and the big control economy is not doing so well? So there is envy. I want our economy to be better than their economy. but I don't trust our people to behave properly unless I control them. So to rejoice is to say, you have done well. What could be better for me than to live in a world where there are people who do well, who are kind and thoughtful and generous? Your good doesn't diminish me in any way. In fact, when I celebrate your good, I get your good as well. It's an infinite uh, expanding system. We ask the Buddhas to teach the Dharma. Without Dharma, we would be lost. We would be caught in prejudice, blown away by our five poisons. And we request the Buddhas not to die. That is to say, we need their availability. In life, if we meet good people who we can have honest, deep connection with, this is such a blessing, because most people, unfortunately, are wrapped inside the bandages of their assumptions. They don't see clearly. They are blind, not because they are intrinsically bad, but they don't see because the karmic veils, the veils of their activity and their assumptions, are very thick for them. So we need the teaching of the Buddhas to, to free us. Then whatever small merit we get from this, we give to others so that they may be enlightened. And we give it to all beings, to all beings, because the infinite commitment to benefit all beings is like an amazing magnifying force that takes even a small piece of virtue and makes it available to all beings because the intention is good. But if you, if you pull back and you shrink that, I want this just for me or my family or my racial group, then it will shrivel and die. It is by giving that the increase occurs. So this is enormously powerful. 
but it only works if it goes in a, to all beings. So then again, we have the four famous immeasurables, which are, again, a, they're like a kind of, as if you were going to learn some martial arts and you have to, you have to learn two things. You have to learn to stand really balanced with your center of gravity down, and then you have to learn how to fall without being harmed. So the four immeasurables are about how do you ground yourself in a way that will not allow the circumstances of life to push you and pull you this way and the other. So we say, may all sentient beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. Happiness makes sense. We understand what that is. The cause of happiness, that's a little more difficult. For some people, it might be food, for others, money, for others, sex. But the real cause of happiness is to be free of the five poisons. That is to say, to be free of a dull mental state in which you rely on assumptions, the received opinions you have from your culture, your education, and so on. So if you free yourself from that encapsulation, you, you start to have the freshness of true awareness of the radiant mind, which is your own mind, but at the moment it's covered. Then we have desire, needing more because we have a sense of lack. Then we have aversion because we feel how you are is too much for me. Get back, go away. I don't want you. And then we have pride and jealousy. These five poisons are very dynamic. They are like a swirling storm and they can completely upset how we are balanced in our life. So it's very, very important to keep thinking and being clear the root of happiness is relative, food, comfort, security. May all beings have that, but may they have the deep deep root of happiness, which is to awaken to your own true existence. In the Dzogchen tradition, we say this to, to be able to see your own face. When we wander in samsara, we are all living inside a mask. We grow up with certain cultural assumptions about being polite to people, about learning to speak in the proper way, and so on. We learn the masks of language. We, especially on an inner level, we learn the, the mask of concepts in which we identify with the thoughts and feelings that run in our mind. But our own true face is the infinite awareness of the Buddha, not anything other than this. And this is the true cause of happiness. And we say, may all sentient beings be free of sorrow and the cause of sorrow. We have many ideas of sorrow. We can see every day misery. There is the misery of birth, old age, sickness, and death. The misery of accidents, of war, of unkindness, of being exploited physically, sexually, and so on. There are many ways in which desolation can arise for beings. And the root of this, again, is not seeing our own intrinsic pure face, the freshness of presence. Then we say, may all sentient beings never be separated from the happiness, which is uncontaminated by even the least speck of sorrow. That happiness could not be a construct. It could not possibly be something that you make or you cause to happen because as you know if you clean your your house your flat after some days it's again there's dust there's dirt we know we don't know where all this dirt comes from but somehow there's always dirt arriving and arriving and arriving if you clean things on a relative level somehow they are not protected in themselves because they're in interaction with other factors like the dust and dirt blowing in through the open window. So 
a happiness which is never touched by any sorrow, that is not a relative happiness. It's not something you can make by looking at a good movie or uh, walking in a beautiful nature. It is the intrinsic happiness of the mind itself. Of course, in our traditions, there are many ways of describing it. In the tantric tradition, it's described as the divergent energy winds that are in the body being gathered into the central channel, the avaduti, and dis re resolved into their own inherent emptiness. In the Dzogchen, we find it by allowing whatever thoughts and feelings come to arise and pass through without causing any trouble. In that way, we come to see that our mind is Vajra. It is uncontaminated, untouched by any limiting factors. So when you see this is how your mind actually is, housework stops. You don't need to be relatively trying to improve it and make yourself more kind or more generous or more this or more that and stop doing the negative because you see these are just transient movements and the mind itself is pure from the very beginning. Then we say, may all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from cherishing friends and relatives and being dismissive of strangers and enemies. This equanimity is vital when we are thinking about situations of war, because war brings people into taking sides. War makes it very difficult to think about what is going on. For example, Britain has had a long connection with the slave trade that went on for many years. It's very difficult for the British establishment to sincerely apologize for the slave trade. These things happened, it's in the past, I wasn't alive then. There are many ways that people can try to avoid implication in it rather than seeing, I, I would have been selfish. If I could make money out of exploiting other people, maybe I would have done that. Why? Because I'm immersed in the five poisons. So equanimity means I'm not going to put one group, my group, my family, my friends above other people. Generosity has to go 360 degrees in all directions equally for everyone. Now, on an outer level, of course, if you've got children, you have to feed your children and keep them warm and buy them presents and so on. Probably not very helpful to say to the children, uh, there are so many poor children in the world, I don't think I'll give you any more presents. That wouldn't feed all the poor people in the world and your own little children would be very unhappy. The, the issue is, when you give to one, in your mind, in your heart, you give to all. We always, just as we imagine all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas filling the space around us, up in the sky, all around us, we can imagine in front of us, all our enemies or the people we find difficult, our friends are behind us, the lineage from our father's side moving out on the right, the lineage from our mother's side out on the left, all these sentient beings, all sentient beings equally receiving the blessing of the Buddha. The position is always inclusive and not exclusive. War means exclusion. Some people should be killed or driven out of their country deprived of freedom. If you have an inclusive attitude and it's profound, it's not on the basis of the qualities you see with the other person. It's just because they're there. So equanimity is very, very challenging for us. It's not something, what it's saying is your commitment to others is not based on their qualities. 
uh, if you look at your own life, when you were a child, you had to, you were always encouraged to try hard at school, to do your best, um, to behave properly to grandmothers and aunts and uncles and so on. There's a lot of lessons that you have to transcend your limitation and become better. And then you become worthy. Then your mother says, oh, I'm very proud of you. You did really well. And then you get a little pat on the head. This is a completely different view. This is saying it's not a reward for being good. I will help all sentient beings because they exist. Their intrinsic Buddha nature or Buddha potential is there. This is what we are working with. And because it is equally there for all beings, all beings are equally uh, available as recipients of our good intention going in all directions. So in this way, we are stepping out of cause and effect, which is the matrix for generating karma. Karma comes about when we uh, develop an intention towards a specific situation and seek advantage or disadvantage for other people in that way. This is beyond that. So then there is a, a very uh, interesting prayer. I'll just go through it quite quickly. Unfailing sources of refuge, the three jewels and the three roots. That's Buddha Dharma Sangha and the Guru, uh, meditation deity and Dakini, and especially Chenrezig, Avalokiteshvara, the benefactor of the world, along with Jetsuntara and Guru Padmasambhava. These three deities are all in the lotus family in the western direction of the mandala, and they are concerned with uh, the purification of desire, which becomes discerning wisdom, the capacity to see each situation precisely as it is, which always stops us from entering into propaganda and dogma, because the actuality of phenomena, how they are in their lived complexity, is not something you can uh, boil up and make into some kind of uh, same flavor soup. The unique specificity of each person, just as they are, is present equally with the Buddha nature, which is the same for all beings. So this is what we what we have to be aware aware of. Like when we say Turkish people are like this or Scottish people are like that, this is a kind of insanity because it doesn't point to anything. There are no such thing as the Turkish people because each person living in Turkey is themselves with their the shape of their face, whether they're energetic, whether their spine is easily bending or not. So unique specificity, which would look like a differentiation and the sameness of being inseparable from emptiness. These two come together united. This is what we have to hold in mind. We pray to you and we ask you to think of the vows you have taken. In the Tibetan tradition, when we pray, what we are saying is not we humbly beg you to do this. We are saying, hey, big people, you said you would do this, now fucking do it. Oi, do it. Just do it. Why would you not do it? Padma Sambhava, you said you would help all beings. I'm a person. I want help. Give it now. Why can you have that confidence? Because of non dual connectivity. Padma Sambhava is not somebody else, somewhere else, far away. Padma Sambhava is the shining presence of your own potential. 
So when we pray to these deities, what you're doing is you're awakening your own potential, which has always been with you, but hidden inside yourself. It says in these present degenerate times, due to the causes and conditions of the wrong ideas and actions of all beings, well, we know it's all over the world, people behave badly. They are selfish. They act for their own immediate benefit. Now we have a crisis with climate change and people are having to think, should I make a lot of sacrifices for the sake of my grandchildren? How will the world be for them? If I keep the temperature in my flat high because I don't like the cold, maybe that will be burning up fuel, which will endanger the climate for them. So maybe better I should put on two sweaters and a coat and sit with a woolen hat on my head. And I, I won't die from doing that, but maybe that will help them. So we have to think of our actions, but mainly people choose selfishness. We take it for granted that we can fly to different places. We can eat soft fruit in the winter time. You go in the supermarket, it's full of endless, endless unnecessary choices. So th these, uh, these outer forms of the wrong ideas and actions of beings uh, are often invisible to these beings because they just think, well, if it's in the supermarket, it must be okay, it must be okay, it must be okay. But we have to practice in Luke and think, what are the implications of my actions? What does it mean to be generous? What does it mean to help people? Each situation where you relate to another person is coming into formation. It's co-emergent. It's not already set up. So in a relationship with someone, maybe you fight a bit or you disagree. Are you there to correct your partner and give them the right way to think? Are you there to fit in with their point of view so that they feel dominant and happy? Nobody can decide these things for yourself. You have to balance yourself. If you let them win all the time, no good. If you try to win all the time, no good. You have to be moving with them. This is what makes life very difficult. As I have said many times, Siya Lama always used to say, the Dharmakaya is easy. Finding your own mind is very easy because it's just there. The Nirmanakaya, being with other people, that's where it's really, really hard. Because people are not the way we want them to be. They stubbornly insist on being themselves. Hmm. I'm trying to help you, and you just want to be you. Hmm. How outrageous. So in some religions, what they do is they collect these bad people and burn them in the square, calling them witches or heretics. In Dharma, we don't do that. What, what we have to do is the teacher or the Buddhist practitioner has to be flexible. Just as the Buddha taught 84,000 dharmas, not one Bible, 84,000 dharmas, because he's teaching different people and he has to teach them in different ways, this is the same for us. We need to be flexible. We need to be responsive. We can't just take up a position. So, uh, although in the statues and so on, it looks like the Buddha sitting on a big throne and never moves, the actuality of the Buddha coming into the world is very relational, very flexible, trying to meet different people in different ways. So with all of this going on, the, there is the commotion of the elements, the earth, water, fire, wind, and space. They are not in balance, which we see with climate change. They're also in our own bodies. There are many new kinds of sickness. We've had this COVID virus. 
there are endless numbers of viruses around in animals, in the forests and jungles. We human beings are cutting down the forest, getting more and more contact with these animals, and these viruses will spread. They spread through birds, they spread through insects. This is how our world is. You, 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 we imagine we can expand and take what we want and there is no consequence. But the consequences are often invisible. Just like in karma, you, you do something and you think you got away with it, nobody found out, you're safe, but the consequence will come and get you later like a boomerang coming back. In the same way, when you undermine the balance of nature, sooner or later, the consequence comes back. So that's what he's meaning it. Things are really unsettled. There are formerly unheard of diseases in humans and animals, and we are oppressed by the planets, the movement of the, the stars and so on, the various snake gods and nagas, the spirit rulers, the, the lords of territory, of water, uh, and various kinds of troublemakers and evil demons. Now, many people nowadays, they don't believe in demons and spirits. We can get rid of them, and then we can live in a rational world. But as we can see, people behave in very irrational ways. War is always the result of something irrational. You imagine that you can win. In life, winning and losing is not a, a helpful thing. It's one of the, 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 the binaries that are the eight worldly concerns. I want to win. I don't want to lose. Because winning and losing are born together, they're like Siamese twins. If you win for a while, sooner or later you're going to lose. So the spirits give us a sense of there are many energy formations all around us, and we need to be very thoughtful and careful about the power of these uh, energy formations. Because although we may not be in contact with them, they are also in contact with us. They feed into things like a distraction when someone's driving a car and then there's an accident, people slip on the stairs. Many, many things arise due to forces because the world is alive. In the, in the teachings in Dzogchen, everything is the mind, the radiance of the mind. It's not a dead thing. There are no fixed things. Everything is a movement of energy, energy interacting all the time. So new pattern formations uh, can happen very easily. Then it says the crops are damaged by rust, night frost and hail, and there is war and dispute. Suddenly emerging, conflicts come out. For example, Britain, for some reason, the majority of people voted to, to separate off from Europe, to have Brexit. Then we think, oh, now we will be self-governing. But as soon as we did that, more and more immigrants started coming across the channel, separating France and England in little rubber boats and so on. And so the number of what we call illegal immigrants increases every year. You can't keep people away. We are not in charge. We are not the boss. When you see in your own life how much you would like to be in charge of everything, then you start to be able to understand a bit more what it's like to be Mr. Putin. He's not from another planet. He is a sentient being caught up in the delusion that he is the master of the world, that he is in charge of what's going on. But our world is so complex in the number of variables that are operating at any time that nobody could have that dominance. It is a delusion. 
rain and water supplies are not appropriate, too much or too little, snow avalanches, there are rodents that destroy the pastures, bringing famine, earthquakes, fire and destruction by other hostile forms of the four elements. In particular, there is trouble for the teachings due to border wars and so on. May all the many kinds of harm and trouble in this world be quickly pacified and completely uprooted. So, on the general relative truth level in which we see self and other as real, we see a difference between day and night, good and bad, hot and cold, and we're locating everything of value on these hierarchies Inside that, turbulence is guaranteed. There has never been a time when the world has been peaceful. There is always war, conflict, differences. Some economies are going up, other economies are going down. When there is a transformation like the ending of the USSR, in countries like Poland, we gain more freedom. For some people, that was very good. For other people, it was terrifying. For the people who were young and creative and wanted to be like an entrepreneur and start their own company, this was a huge opportunity. For an older person who had been working in a state factory with secure lunch cooked every day in the canteen and a pension and so on, now to have this freedom was terrifying. Everything depends on the specificity of our karmic structure, our body, our emotions. That's why we cannot say objectively, this is definitely good or this is definitely bad. And that's why we have a lot of turbulence. So then he's saying for all beings, human and non-human, all the animals, because when there is war, you think how many uh, animals are going to be killed in this war. Many kind of insects, these huge tanks going out over the fields. Many, many uh, difficulties arising. May the precious, excellent bodhicitta arise naturally so that free from harmful and troublesome thoughts and deeds, they have minds full of love for each other. So we wish this for all beings. They have bodhicitta. They have this Buddha nature inside them, a Buddha mind as a potential. But at the moment, it's obscured and covered over by uh, negative thoughts. So we're saying, may all obscurations be removed from people's minds. What makes someone look good or look bad to us is just the patterning of their obscurations. The intrinsic, the inherent, that which is there from the very beginning is all good. We say it's a Kuntu Zampo, Samanta Bhadra, the primordial Buddha, pure from the very beginning. All limitations arrive contingently. They suddenly arrived and then they start to move in relation to each other, dependent co-origination, all the many factors. So may the pure mind of all beings be revealed to all beings and to each other. This is our deep prayer, not that may the bad people be defeated and the good people triumph. This uh, kind of language is unhelpful. And to say something on that, Buddhism is full of war language. It doesn't look at it at first, but if we say Gyal, Gyal Gyalwa, Gyalwa Karmapa, means uh, the victorious Karmapa, but it's linked to Gyalpo king and there are Gyalpo demons, victory over others, Chomdende, this is meaning victorious. Arahant means defeating the, the, the demons, defeating the enemy. So a lot of Buddhist language also is dualistic and uh, related to notions of triumph. 
The reason they use that language is because oh, that's the language of ordinary people. What you see in the in the cinema is usually something about winning and losing, whether it's a love story or a war story or an adventure story. So winning and losing. Shakespeare is nothing but winning and losing. Triumph and defeat, tragedy, tragic comedy, comedy. All the forms of drama are structured by duality. So when we step out of that, we are not concerned with victory. What we want is liberation, freedom. May the dull coverings fall away. So we talk about the naked mind, naked awareness. If you have a shower, you take your clothes off and you go into the shower and you wash and you feel very, very fresh. This is naked. The dirt comes off and you are you don't need any covering. Then you have to put clothing on again in our cultural structures. But the, the mental clothing of personal identity, your gender, your language, your race, your age, all of these, these are kinds of clothing, which if you hold on to them, means that it will be very difficult to awaken to your mind as it is. So when we sit in meditation practice, we, we can feel how we get carried away by little rifts of thoughts. We find ourselves merged in a sensation. This is like putting on clothing. You've gone into the meditation for a shower, but you can't feel the water because you keep putting on a jumper, a sweater, where's my bra, where's my knickers, putting more and more things back on again. You don't need them. Meditation is the best time to be naked. The thoughts come and go. You don't need to cover yourself in thoughts, feelings, sensations. They just come and they go. Come and they go. So this is what he's pointing to here. Because if this happens, then the mind can be full of love. May all the world realms have happiness, joy, and prosperity. And may the doctrines of the Buddha spread far and remain long. So that's a beautiful aspiration. By the power of the truth of the three roots, the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, and whatever virtuous roots there are in samsara and nirvana, in the power of our excellent and very pure intentions, our prayers and aspirations must be fulfilled. So, <clears throat> this kind of statement is something you find a lot in Buddhist uh, teachings. And it may not be something you're very familiar with in your own life. It is the power of the practice. That the, the practice is not just something you do, but it, it, it is as if you're plugging yourself into a universal energy system, which can then be efficacious in bringing about good results. And in particularly, we'll, as we come on to the next bit, where we're concerned with repulsing negative forces, sending these forces back before they touch us, before we are absorbed into them, in order to maintain a clear reflective surface, we also have to have the sense that we're not sucking in, we're not pushing something bad out, but we are kind of flicking it back. If you were playing table tennis with someone, you don't want to be slamming all the time. You can just flick your wrist and the ball will go back. You have more control if you're doing something fine. So what we're wanting to do is to have a sense, the power of this practice, I use it to protect. If you, have, if you have no power, it's difficult. So the enemies of this are self-doubt, 
thinking I'm an ordinary person, I haven't been doing the practice very long, maybe I don't really know what it means. By the time you run 10 thoughts like that, you're underneath the carpet. You have to have the confidence, this is the power of the Buddha's word. And with this power, it is we can effect change in the situation. So then we come to the Heart Sutra, which has been recited in all Buddhist countries so many times, endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. Um, so I, I will go through it really quite quickly because you can read it and it's very self-explanatory. In this uh, sutra, Buddha Shakyamuni, through his meditation practice, is allowing Avalokiteshvara, who is a great bodhisattva, to clarify the doubts of Shariputra, who stands as a leading representative of the Theravadan. So it's a little bit of Buddhist history embedded in the text. The particular point here is, rather than having a focus on your own liberation, on developing the different meditation levels, the jhanas, so that you are uh, unaffected by disturbance, in the Mahayana view, we include the liberation of all beings. So this is what Avalokiteshvara is standing for, the clarity of the mind which can free all beings. And so uh, Shariputra asked him, how should a, a person of good family, how should someone with some potential to understand something, how should they go about it? And then uh, Avilokateshvara explains. <clears throat> and he says, they should look thoroughly in the manner I will describe and thus clearly see that the five factors of composition are intrinsically empty of inherent existence. The five factors of composition are in the Theravadan tradition seen as the basic constructive factors of particularly humans, but generally all sentient beings. That is to say, there is a form and then feeling, which is positive, negative, and neutral, perception, associations or mental constructs, and consciousness. And when these five factors are operating together, that's what we experience as this is me, this is how I am. In the, so Avilokiteshvara is saying, these things which you can take to be fixed and definite are actually empty of any self. So just as I, as James, am empty of Jamesness because I arise from the interaction of these five compositional factors, so the five compositional factors, which could seem to be real, are actually empty. Everything is empty. So then he goes on. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form, form is not other than emptiness. So if you look at any form, it could be a tree, it could be an apple, it could be a tomato. You look at the tomato, it's there. It seems to be a tomato. This, of course, is just our stupidity. It is a tomato that was growing on a tomato plant. It has been removed from the tomato plant. And if you keep it long enough, it will rot. It will go moldy. So a tomato is a tomato for a brief period of its life. When it's a green tomato growing on the bush, we don't like it. Now it's a red tomato, you have to take it off and, and prepare to use it. And if you leave it too long, it's no good either. So a tomato is a process moving in time. It is dependent co-origination. 
if the tomato plant wasn't put in the garden and given a lot of water in the summertime, the tomatoes wouldn't have grown. If the tomato hadn't been plucked at the right time, it wouldn't be available for you. Now is your job to eat it at the right time. So your desire to eat the tomato and the rightness of the tomato, this is dependent co-origination. These two factors come together. As you approach the tomato, it will start to unravel because you're going to chop it in pieces or fry it in a pan, or maybe you just bite into it and eat it raw if it's delicious. But you are concerned to de-tomato the tomato. If the tomato was made of steel, there would be a real problem. You couldn't eat it. What attracts you to the tomato is your capacity to destroy the tomato. And you, the reason you can destroy the tomato is because it lacks inherent self-existence. It is not a separate entity. And that is its vulnerability. We human beings are vulnerable. If we stop breathing, we die. I need air. I need air. I need it the same temperature, I need food, I need many things. I don't have an independent existence. So this is the, the, the heart of the Heart Sutra that says everything is linked together. There are no truly separate entities. There are no isolates. There are no things which are existing in and of themselves. That is to say, our world is a world of collaboration. And if you appreciate the finesse of how the different parts move together, it's so amazing. This is, a, is an, again, another uh, reason why war is so terrible. Because we all have this amazing body. We have liver. We have kidneys, we have bowels, we have heart, we have teeth, we have lungs. All of these parts are functioning together. They collaborate together to give us the sense of I am me. Without their collaboration, my sense of being me wouldn't be held. I am a flower. I am the flowering of the collaborative system of the body, which is collaborating with the environment. So the whole world, the whole infinity of dharmas, of phenomena, collaborating together gives rise to us. We are each a flower manifesting whew, moment by moment through our body, through our speech, through the thoughts and so on in our mind. So the emptiness is the potential for manifestation. If you were profoundly defined, if you were just one thing, your life would be over. It is your flexibility your pliability, your capacity to relate to circumstances, which is your life. Some people, unfortunately, get terrible conditions where they become paralyzed. They have to lie in a bed for a long time, maybe in a coma. This, this makes life very difficult. If you have a body that's reasonably healthy and you can stand up when you want to, and sit down when you want to, go to the toilet by yourself. This is a blessing. As I get older, I start to think, oh my God, how long will this last? That's a, it's heaven. Due to causes and conditions, like being young, you run up and down the stairs. After a while, it's like climbing Mount Everest. It is dependent origination. There is no truth to your own identity 
<clears throat> there is no truth to anything embedded just inside itself. I become me with you according to you. Me for you is the means by which I find out how I am. I show myself to the different people I relate to or to the different environments I'm in, a different sitting in a different chair or putting on different shoes or cooking. So if I'm frying something or boiling something, my arms are going in different gestures. All day long, you are moving in conversation with the world. This is the meaning of form and emptiness. No form is fixed and you relate to different forms through your own movement. You are not a fixed form. This is why these modern inventions like photography are terrible. You know, they're terrible. Many religions had a big prohibition on making representations. Buddhism also in the early days, you could show the Buddha by uh, showing the, the Bodhi tree or by showing a little kind of throne where he sat. They say you shouldn't represent the Buddha at all, but in the later part of the pre-Christian era, this uh, production started to increase of statues of the Buddha. Then you look at the statue and you think that's a Buddha. Never a Buddha. Piece of stone, piece of metal. When you do prostrations and you bow to the Buddha, you're bowing to your mind. Why would you bow to a piece of metal? What's it going to do? You, you are bowing to your faith that says, I believe in the Buddha. It's always the mind, always the mind. So the mind is full of thoughts, feelings, sensations, memories, plans. The mind itself is not a thing. So the more you see the absence of fixity in phenomena, that they arise relationally, but not absolutely, then you start to see connectivity. When you see something, so if you have a cup, you know that someone designed it. If it's a handmade cup, a potter has made it. They did it with the clay that was dug from the ground, went to the shop. The artist went and bought the clay in the shop and so on and so forth. They baked it in the oven. The oven was fired usually by electricity nowadays, which is generated by water tumbling down the mountain or by burning coal. In that way, if you start to look, you see everything is connected. There is not one single atom in the universe that is self-existing. This is the whole meaning of uh, the Heart Sutra. Everything you can think of, your mental consciousness, your hearing, your intelligence, everything arises due to causes and conditions. Even, as it says at the end of the Heart Sutra, even primordial wisdom is empty. Why? Because if you turn it into a thing, it will stop being primordial wisdom. It is uncatchable. When you feel relaxed and open and you have a sense of awareness and the mind is like a bright spaciousness with many things occurring, you can't say anything about it. It's not, it's not an object for thought. It's not an object for language. You can say, I feel sad, I feel tired, I'm hungry, give me a hug, or I find you really annoying. When you make statements like that, you have a sense somebody is there and you can comment on them or you comment on your feelings about them. It is the somethingness of phenomena which is part of our uh, structure of being a person with other people. Actually, when you look, even towards people you think you know well, they're not exactly how you think they are. 
No, are you, are you okay? You look a bit different today. Ah, of course they look different. They're always looking different. Always looking different. Nobody ever looks the same. The fact that you recognize certain things is because you have a template as if you work in the police department, they have their little profile. You have your profile. This is my friend. Oh, John, you look like my image of John. Oh, that's good. Now I know you're John because you look like my image of John. This is called mediated connectivity. This is the meaning of consciousness in Buddhism, namparshepa. Means our relation with the world is cooked through pre existing templates, pre existing images of how it is. It's not fresh. Awareness is fresh. Consciousness is just like some big Amazon warehouse moving everything around and dispatching parcels here, there, and everywhere. So the, when you go through the Heart Sutra, it's so important you read it slowly. Even if you just read one paragraph of it every time you do the practice, you don't have to read it all, but you just look, take 10 minutes to look and try to see, is this true? Because you have to massage the meaning into yourself so that it becomes a living truth for you. Then it will be transformatory. Then you will really, so if you just repeat the words in a hollow way, you won't get any benefit. So what the Heart Sutra is saying is that everything which arises is without inherent self-nature. And so at, towards the end, it's all distilled into the mantra, tadiyata, gate, gate, para, gate, para, sam, gate, bodhi, soha. This is meaning that the, what we might say, the truth of our life is gone. That is to say, it's, it's beyond, it's beyond what we think it is. It's gone to the other side, it's gone beyond, and it, we are awakened by seeing it is gone beyond. As long as you are living in your mentally constructed world, thinking about things, labeling them, naming them, stabilizing your understanding, you're pulling the freshness of the world into your interpretive system. But if you start to allow whatever is arising in the mind to come and go, then you have the freshness of the awareness. And do you see everything? All these substantial truths that I thought were there, my mother, my father, what this make of bread tastes like, what this kind of beer tastes like, everything you thought you knew was dependent, was dependent. And if you stay close to your senses, they will show you. When you have a cold, this favorite beer will taste differently. Your sense of smell will be different. As your body changes, so the impact of phenomena shifts. Everything is moving together. So what is gone? The familiar reliance on fixed objects. When that's gone, then going back to the refuge at the beginning, then you're really starting to take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. I take refuge in awareness, not in phenomena. Phenomena are always going, going, gone. Always, this comes, this goes, this comes, this goes. So, hopefully you can see that this is vital in terms of these troubled times. If you start to have an accumulation, if you start to say, why do the Russians do this? Or even just, why does Putin do this? Why does that man behave in this way? What does he think he's thinking? If you catch yourself, you are making an image of this person in your mind. Then when you think about Putin, you're, you're thickening 
the density of your idea about who he is. What you're essentially doing is developing a prejudice. Now, when we look back at what happened under the Nazis and their uh, treatment of the, the Roma people and so on, we see they knew the state, the true status of the Roma, the gypsies. They knew the true status of disabled children. They knew the true status of Jews. These people should be destroyed. The communists, they should be destroyed. Because we know the truth about them. Because we have an idea in our mind. So this mental formation, all oh, the Jews are like this. This is existing always, always true under all conditions. So before you meet a Jew, you know what is a Jew. Before you meet a gypsy, you know what gypsies are. So the mental formation becomes the truth. And this is what the Heart Sutra is saying. This is deadly. This is deadly. Do not develop mental images of the world because you will feel that you are seeing more clearly. I know what this is. But actually, you will be going blind because you will be imagining and not seeing. So release and release and release all these compositional factors so you stay fresh in the moment. And in war, there are so many provocations to hate people or to be fearful or angry. And this solidifies the sense of who is involved. And for Dharma people, uh, this is a great opportunity because you can see when you maybe watch something on the, your computer or television and you see some child with his arm taken off and some feeling arises in you, oh, then you have to catch that feeling. Oh, powerful but empty. It's like uh, in the Caribbean when they get these huge storms, winds blowing, great hurricanes blowing in. They are very dangerous. And what are they? Wind. There is nothing you can grasp, but it's powerful. And this is the same. Your anger, your dislike, your distaste, your sense of all the brave Ukrainians fighting, how amazing, Bravo, bravo, like this. Oh, I am feeling something on the basis of taking this as having inherent existence. It is a dreamlike formation. It is an illusion. Illusion is the middle way. It's neither real, truly existing, nor is it completely unreal, nothing at all. It is appearance and emptiness and if we can hold that then uh, we have some capacity to help others so with this understanding then we move on to this section repelling all troubles this uh, practice of dokpa of sending back what is not given is very very important We're not retaliating. If somebody upsets you and gets to you, you, the urge for revenge of, I'll make you feel what it's like, of doing something is very quick and very strong. And we, again, we follow the middle way. So <clears throat> in this section on page five, <clears throat> rip, headed repelling all troubles this first section is uh, by a verse by Nagarjuna the famous Madhyamika uh, philosopher and yogi so he's saying whatever arises in dependent co-origination is without stopping and without starting without annihilation and without permanence without coming and without going without diverse meanings and without just one meaning. These uh, eight 
positionings are seen as uh, four fundamental polarities which are used to organize our world. They stand in the place of all polarities. So he's saying everything in this world arises in dependent origination. It doesn't exist in itself. And therefore you can't say that it's uh, stopping or starting because it's moving in a seamless pulsation of organizational factors, originating factors. You can only say stopping and starting when you freeze the world and then you put a little circle around one bit and then you compare it with another like this or like that. But when you're actually present in your life, there's no beginning and ending. Things don't get annihilated and vanish forever, but neither um, do they have permanence. So he's saying, thus, all conceptual constructs are fully pacified. That is to say, whenever you make one proposition in your mind, you will find that the opposite polarity is also hovering around. These people are really bad. That means somewhere there must be real people who are very good. You can't have hot without cold. If you only had cold, then you wouldn't know what cold was because it would just be cold. It is the fact that you have hot and cold that allows the gradations between these for you to put different kind of markers. So hot and cold are not separated polarities, but they're actually a matrix for developing the possibilities of relatedness. So if we say the Ukrainians are very good and they're fighting for freedom and these Russian soldiers, they're deluded and they're only going to cause trouble. People in, in uh, the Ukraine who are carrying their guns now, many of them, they're not soldiers. They're only carrying guns because of the Russian invasion. The invasion and the Ukrainian holding guns are born together. They arise together. They are in dependent origination. So if you see that, then instead of holding on to the concept as a means of intelligence or a means of truth. See, oh, this is a linked patterning. I need to have a bad people in order to have good people. I need to have a cold winter in order to say the next winter was warmer. I need to have beautiful flowers to have fading flowers. I need to have a delicious apple on the can only be there on the basis of having a non-delicious apple. These are hierarchies of value and they are artificial interpretations. They are constructs. People are killing other people on the basis of conceptual identification. People kill because of ideas. The oomph or the energy behind it we can call anger or hatred or rage but the real focus is an idea so for the mr putin the ukraine is part of russia that's an idea on the basis of that idea he feels entitled to invade and to take over and the fact that people will die is not so important for him because the principle the idea comes first. So if you see that, then you think, oh, in the, when I read the Buddhist text, they're always talking about, you know, conceptual elaboration or avoid excessive conceptualization. It's not that you, you shouldn't have thoughts, but if you believe that your thought is telling you the truth, then you have to be a little bit careful. 
because it feels true to me because of my history, the country I live in, the language I live in, my gender, my age, many factors are causing this particular pattern to feel true. There is no inherent existence in phenomena. There are no inherently good people and inherently bad people. All formations are the energy of the mind. So he says, to the peaceful doctrines, the excellent teachings of the speech of the perfect Buddha, we pay homage. So this is the, the Buddha's teaching. Stay with awareness, let concepts come and go. Once you start believing that concepts tell you the truth, you're at the mercy of dogma, propaganda, cultural belief systems, and so on. So then, then now he's saying uh, some two paragraphs of giving you the sense of the truth of the Dharma. Namo, salutation. Salutation to the Guru, to the Buddha, to the Dharma, to the Sangha, to the great mother transcendental wise discerning, Prajnaparamita, that she is the, 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 the heart essence of the Heart Sutra, and to her surrounding circle of sons, the Buddhas of the Ten Directions. By the force and effective power of making salutation to you, these true words of mine must be fulfilled. All the Buddhas, all possible Buddhas are born through the Great Mother. Prajnaparamita, the transcendent wisdom, we imagine her like a goddess. And there are different ways of talking about it. Her vagina, the, 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 the bhaga is seen as the symbol of emptiness and that every, just as a child could only be born if the birth canal was opened. So everything is moving in the space of the mother, in the space of emptiness. In fact, everything is unborn because nothing ever comes out of the vagina of the great mother. It's within this. So this or the, the womb of the great mother, arising and passing, arising and passing. So this is like a mirror in which reflections are arising and passing, arising and passing. The reflection is always in the mirror. You can't take the reflection out of the mirror and you can't take phenomena out of emptiness and you can't take the Buddhas out of the awareness of emptiness. So this is what this is meaning. In former times, Plawon Jachin contemplated, this is an early uh, being who uh, understood the meaning of emptiness. He contemplated the deep meaning of the transcendental wise discerning. He read its profound words and thus was able to repulse all corrupting demonic tendencies. Similarly, we also contemplate the profound meaning of the transcendental wise discerning and read these profound words. And due to this, we, the gurus, disciples, sponsors, beneficiaries, and all those we, who are connected with us must have all our troubles, obstacles, and difficulties completely repelled. We must be without them. They must be pacified. So then we say, dock, dock, dock. And this uh, clapping noise, the explosive quality of the noise is seen as something, as a force that symbolizes sending back, driving back. So if you put something in front of a mirror, it looks like the reflection is in the mirror, but the mirror is uncontaminated. So similarly, we want to have the clarity of our mind, which is uncontaminated by the many provocations that arise. So 
if somebody says, James, you know, you're just like all these other Scottish people, you're just mean, you're just stupid. Am I Scottish? If I feel I'm Scottish, why are you insulting Scottish people? Why, who the hell are you? Oi, what are you doing? But if I just hear this sound and emptiness, who is going to receive the insult to the Scottish people? I have been elected to stand and for and represent all Scottish people. And if you continue to speak in that way to me, I'm going to fucking kick you. Do you understand? Because I'm Scottish. It happens very quickly. It happens in every playground, in every school where children tease each other and provoke them and they get upset and then there's a joy in the upset of the other person because their words came to me. It went into me and started to do something to me. So that's what this text is saying. Relax your mind into spacious awareness. Do not be the recipient of these enemy attacks. The one who starts to vibrate is the ego who is identified with nationality, age, gender, economic situation, and so on. That's what causes the vibration. As long as you identify with a constituent factor and somebody says something against it, of course you're going to vibrate. Somebody says they love you and you think, oh, really? Oh, that's wonderful. Or somebody say, God, you're ugly. Huh? Huh? We, we know this. It happens so quickly because I am the one who is being addressed. So who is this I? This is the heart of our Buddhist practice to see the I is empty. It doesn't mean there is no presence. We are alive. We are present but we are not a thing. And it is the thingness, which is the delusion, which is created and held in place by this uh, attachment to the idea of self. So when we're saying all of these forces must be repelled, it's because they are empty and I am empty. And so it can go back. There is no truth to this. There is no truth to this. We don't have to be the object. So in the story I repeated in the introduction to the, to the practice text, when the Buddha goes begging and he's standing with his begging bowl and the man starts to insult him and is furious with him, lazy, useless, good for nothing, the Buddha's just standing. He said, I came requesting food. I didn't request anger. Keep your anger. Now, for most of us, if someone is angry with us, we get upset. We feel it inside. We start to tremble. Maybe we want to run away. Maybe we want to attack them because we've gone into a vibration. And this vibration is the tension between subject and object inside us. So in the meditation practice, Again and again, we release our identification with the patterns of uh, appearances which are arising. If we're not able to do that, then it's very easy to be caught into a vibration. So then he says method. Method here means the, the counterpart to uh, wisdom or uh, wise discernment. Method is um, compassion. They say uh, wisdom is emptiness and method is compassion. And this is like in the tantric symbolism, this is the male and female energies which are united when you see uh, the Buddha and the uh, female Buddha together. Wisdom and compassion unite and so on. This, that's the meaning of method. Method, protection, purity, and Mahayana practice in decline, and the work of Mara who deceives sentient beings, all these troubles must be repelled. 
So the work of Mara is this uh, potentials which hover in the environment around us and which can be activated. It's not that everything is contained inside you because we've already been looking a lot at dependent origination. How I am is linked with how the environment is. So the Maras are the force fields which surround us and which can activate us into reactivity. All these troubles must be repelled. And again, talk, talk, talk. For those practicing to gain complete enlightenment, all outer and inner troubles which create obstacles must be fully pacified. Talk, 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 talk. Difficulties always occur in life. There are many different kinds of provocations. We cannot control the outer forms of the world. What we can do is not be caught by them. The one who is caught is your ego. Your awareness has never been caught, is not now being caught, and never will be caught. Awareness is not a thing. Our, our ego self feels like a thing. I, me, myself. I am like this. I like this. I don't like that. That's what we get caught by, the self-construct. <clears throat> and if you think of your life, many of the things you think about come from messages from parents, from friends, brothers, sisters, teachers, and so on. And these have been internalized, and you have, you're living in a construct of your sense of self. This is your vulnerability. So when we do this uh, Guru Yoga of the White Art, we relax and allow all these constitutive factors to arise and pass. And then we realize, oh, if there is enough space, there are no accidents. If the road is empty, you won't hit another car. But if you are in the rush hour and people are driving badly, then you're more likely to have an accident. The busier your mind, the more traffic, the, the easier it is to get lost. Okay, so that's the, the basis of uh, sending all these uh, forms back. Then we have this brief uh, Tonglen practice. Uh, this is a very uh, sweet, brief form of it. Whenever I am glad, I will dedicate that joy to the happiness of all beings. May their happiness fill the sky. Whenever I get trouble, I will take the sufferings of all beings as my own burden. May the oceans of suffering become dry. So, Offering up happiness, joy, health to all beings, including the torturers, the prison guards, the vicious soldiers, to all the heartless ones, we offer joy. And we take from them their misery, their anger, their fuge, confusion, their regret. We take all of that into our heart where we dissolve it in emptiness. You cannot do Tonglen practice giving and receiving without emptiness. Otherwise, it's crazy. You know, we're not, we're not masochistic. We are dissolving the solidity which exists in other people's minds, their hatred. Whatever these Russian leaders are thinking about the Ukrainians, it's quite solid. It's quite definitive. We know what they're like, and they shouldn't be doing this. They're Nazis. They're this. They're that. What we want to do is to take this solidity, these thought formations, and just allow them to dissolve like snowflakes hitting a pond of water and vanishing. Just keep dissolving and dissolving and dissolving. Then we say... Uh, Another verse, which is from Shantideva, the great Indian yogi, when merely the thought of helping others is more excellent than the worship of the Buddhas, 
it's unnecessary to mention the greatness of striving for the happiness and welfare of all beings without exception. So this is just a further reminder that generosity of spirit, being available for others, not judging, not comparing and contrasting, but giving an open welcome to everyone and trying to see through the hooks of their obscuration to their Buddha nature, which is inside. Some people are quite unpleasant. They're rude, they're insulting. If you react to that and you say, I don't like them, huh? this is a Buddha. This is a Buddha. I don't like that Buddha. Why? Because he's always picking his nose. Disgusting. Bad Buddha. So we all have our little things we like, we don't like. And on the basis of that, we blind ourselves to the Buddha nature of all beings. So the deeper we go in the practice, all beings are Buddhas. And they have obscurations and covering, but that is not the main thing. And, but if we are interested in the clothes, we never see the naked. We want to see our own naked mind and we want to see the naked minds of all beings and not react to their clothes. Then we dedicate the merit. By the virtue of doing this practice, may all beings awaken to how they actually are. May they see their own original face. May the mask come off. May they see I am awareness, not thought, not cultural beliefs. I am present awareness. May all beings enjoy the rich happiness of this world and be free of anxiety, fear, and harm. So that's a wonderful wish to have. May everyone be free of anxiety. May the people in Ukraine, in, in towns which are being bombed, may they be free of anxiety. And may the soldiers also be free of anxiety. Anxiety makes people dangerous. I don't want to be hurt. You might hurt me. So the best way for me to be safe is to kill you. This is the very primitive logic of anxiety. But we share the world with all beings, with insects, with fish, with birds, people of different cultures. So how will we have flexible tolerance? That means we have to allow other people to be in ways that make us feel unsafe or anxious. And we dissolve our mental constructs. Then the Buddha is in the palm of your hand. Then you are centered in your own mind. But as long as you're saying, when you do that, I feel really unsafe. Now I'm saying you mustn't be the way you are in order for me to be safe. I'm only saying that because you're being horrible to me. But I'm still telling you how you should be. And if I do that, you probably won't be happy. So we are meditators again and again, relax, release, open. And when you open and you look, every insult has already dissolved. Every hurt around the heart has already dissolved. When your heart is covered in bruises from parents, from childhood, then it's very easy for someone just to touch it with one light finger. <gasps> so painful. You have to let your heart heal. In the two methods, the two great balms are wisdom and compassion. Both will heal the heart. Then you won't be afraid. So, now we have gone through the text. I hope you do it. I hope you enjoy doing it. And there are so many people who need our prayers, and especially when we dedicate the merit, we can think of all those who are suffering, who have lost their homes, lost family members, lost any sense of their identity. Because then you can reflect, oh, my identity is based on my job and my flat and being able to take the kids to school. 
I have built my house on sand. All these factors that give me my sense of being me are not stable at all. For these people in Ukraine, a month ago, they couldn't have imagined this would suddenly happen. Now their life is just like stones running down a mountain. Before it looked stable and now it's a big landslide. So we should learn from this and take refuge in the unborn awareness, which is the true gift of all the Buddhas. And on the basis of that, we can truly help others. Okay, my dears, I think that's uh, the end. I was not expecting to do this today, but anyway, hopefully. Thank you so fun. much. Thank you so much, James, and everybody. Yes. Bye for now. Thank you. Thanks, James. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, James. Bye-bye. Thank you, James. Bye-bye. 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 B